My name is Kevin. I'm one of the event hosts here at Powell's Books. And before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. And if you don't already do so, please follow us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, as well as our YouTube channel. Tonight, we're honored to welcome Itan Thomas in conversation with Dave Zirin in his new book, Police Brutality and White Supremacy, The Fight Against American Traditions. Etan Thomas, an 11-year NBA veteran, weaves together his personal experiences with police violence and white supremacy with multiple interviews of family members of victims of police brutality, as well as activist athletes and other public figures, such as Steph Curry, Chuck D, Sue Bird, Jake Tapper, Jamil Hill, Hill, Mark Cuban, Stephen Jackson, and many others. Thomas also speaks with retired police officers about their efforts to change policing and white allies about their experiences with privilege and their ability to influence other white people. He also examines the history of racism, white supremacy, and the prevalence of both in the current moment. He looks at the origins of white supremacy in the US dating back to the country's inception and explores how it was interwoven into Christianity interviewing leading voices both in and outside of the church. Finally, with prominent voices in the media and education, Thomas discusses the continued cultivation of these injustices in American society. Thomas will be joined in conversation by Dave Zirin, sports editor for The Nation and author of The Kaepernick Effect, Taking a Knee, Changing the World. This evening's event will include an audience Q&A. Please use that Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question at any time. And if someone has a type of question you'd like, you can also upvote that particular question. Perhaps most importantly, please support our authors and pals by purchasing a copy of Police Brutality and White Supremacy from us. <clears throat> a link to buy that book and Natan's other books will be shared in the chat a few times tonight as well as linked by Dave's books. We're so happy to welcome you both. Thanks for being here, Etan Thomas and Dave Zirin. Oh, thank you so much. It's great to be here. I'm Dave Zirin. I'm honored to be doing this, not only because I love this book. It's an amazing book by Etan Thomas, Police Brutality and White Supremacy, The Fight Against American Traditions, but also because we're doing this event with Powell's City of Books, just a, a legendary store uh, on the book landscape. So any association with Powell's uh, certainly does me proud. Uh, Etan Thomas, how you doing, sir? I'm doing pretty good. How you doing? Well, I'm kind of blown away by this book, so I want to jump right into it. Um, so we have as much time as possible. Before I start with my many questions, just want to remind folks that if you want to ask a question at any point during the conversation, click on that Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Do not ask your question in the chat box, for I will not see it. So Q&A box, please. Um, and then we'll get to your questions uh, uh, partway in. So my goodness, I mean, I imagine, I'm imagining you, Atan, like in, in, your, in, your, in an office, thinking to yourself, what's my next book going to be about? And thinking this through. And coming upon this idea of doing a book, Police Brutality and White Supremacy, The Fight Against American Traditions, how did you come to that topic? You know, it's interesting because, you know, uh, I did We Matter, Athletes and Activism, and it's almost like a, a part two, but going in deeper into the topic. Um, you know, in, in We Matter, I talked about what, what has, you know, brought a lot of athletes to use their voices and their platforms um, in a way that hasn't been seen in a, in a long time. And so in that, you know, the, the topic is usually police brutality. And there's a lot of different things that have been going on and people have been, been, been seeing, you know, through social media and they've been speaking out. So I just wanted to go into more depth about all of this and really solution oriented and what can happen. And I wanted to talk to different you know, police officers and, you know, allies and, you know, everything, the whole gambit and, and really just try to tackle this issue uh, starting from the beginning. So I started all the way back and then just kind of went all the way up to the present. Mm. Yeah, starting all the way back, like really getting into the history of this. 
and of these issues within some of these interviews. Uh, there's so much in the book that we can get into, but I think we have to start just asking you about the cover and what went into the cover and the inspiration for the cover. If folks haven't seen it, this is a Tom Thomas, you know, um, enacting the, the, the very famous iconic photograph of Huey P. Newton, a co-founder of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense uh, in the chair uh, with the beret, leather jacket. And I, what made you say to yourself, that's the image I want to be the first thing people see before they open the book? Well, I want to kind of pay homage to the people who I, you know, read about growing up and admired, you know, with We Matter, I paid homage to Malcolm X, of course, and tried to, you know, um, you know mimic the pose and the, you know, iconic pose of Malcolm X. I wanted to do the same thing here with Huey P. Newton and just looking at the Panthers and everything that they embody of, of trying to fight for justice, for peace, for, you know, ending police brutality, for, you know, unity. Um, you know, I had a chance to, to, um, you know, interview and have Fred Hampton Jr. write the foreword. And so in that, his, and talking about his father, um, you know, and the Rainbow Coalition, and, it, and if anybody knows about that, it was really about bringing different people together. I mean, he brought the young patriots with the young lords and the Black Panthers, and they all fought, you know, and stood together and protested together for a common cause. And I thought, I think that was just great if anybody saw the movie um, you know, Judas and the Black Messiah. They depicted it a little bit there, but you know, if you've read about it, you see how that that how significant it really was. So, you know, there's a lot that I wanted to to do with this book. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's there for sure. I'm gonna just very very quickly read out the chapter titles for people so they just get a okay. sense of what it is you're covering because this is such an incredible topic and I think it'll be good for people to hear how the book is framed. So it goes chapter one, Rodney King, chapter two, Central Park Five, chapter three, George Floyd, chapter four, defunding the police, chapter five, black women and the police, chapter six, white supremacy in the US Capitol, chapter seven, white privilege, chapter eight, whitewashed education and media, chapter nine, whitewashed Christianity, chapter 10, white allies and accomplices, chapter 11, sisters of the movement, and then the afterwards by Chairman Fred Hampton Jr. and a poem by your son, Malcolm. I mean, my goodness, the, the breadth of topics, I mean, it, it almost takes your breath away. And it, it feels like this is something that you could have written yesterday, given the debates that are roiling this country right now. I mean, how, how did you approach the time? I mean, there's so much you can talk about with white supremacy and police brutality. How did you narrow in your own mind these particular topics? I mean, well, first, I just want to take it from, you know, my first experience and really seeing police brutality, um, you know, with the Rodney King verdict. I remember I was in middle school. And, you know, now, you know, young people could look at different cases, different things on their phone and social media all the time. It wasn't like that, you know, back in the early 90s. And so I remember seeing Rodney King being beaten. And then I remember seeing the verdict. And I was just shocked. I was like, wait a minute, how is this possible? Like, how could this happen? And our entire middle school, Carver Middle School in Tulsa, Oklahoma, was like about to erupt. Like everybody was, you know, completely beside themselves. So I wanted to go back and I interviewed, um, I reached out to Rodney King's daughter, uh, Laura Dean King and to talk to her about what that was like and that experience and what it did to her father and what it did to her family. And a lot of times people, you know, you go, you see a case happen and then it's, it's kind of trending and then you kind of move on, but they don't know the after effects of the family. So really hearing her talk about everything that happened afterwards, um, you know, that was really a, a, a tough interview to do. But then also I talked to Craig Hodges, who was there at the time and he was trying to get the NBA players to protest during that time. And of course, you know, Magic and Michael didn't really want to, but he's talking about how it impacted him while he was playing and, you know, led him to really challenge Michael Jordan, his teammate. So, I mean, you know, I, I took different perspectives and experiences with each topic. Mm. And then you go into the Central Park Five. I mean, you would have been very young when that, the case went down. Were, were you aware of it at the time or was it something you learned about as you became more political? as you got older? Well, no. So I was, I, I was born in Harlem, and then I moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma when I was young. But I spent all my summers in Harlem. 
So I was in Harlem at the time that that happened. I remember it because it was 1989. I remember um, Public Enemy with uh, Fight the Power came out. Like, it, you know, there's certain things that I just remember from that time period. And so, you know, I tell the story of how, you know, my, my grandfather would take me to the park, you know, to play ball against the older guys because I was tall. And I literally remember the police coming and like rounding everybody up, all the young black and brown, you know, teenagers up. And I tell the story of when I got separated from my grandfather and it was this, you know, big intense moment um, and, and hearing my grandmother talk about um, seeing Trump on TV calling for the young men to be executed and what that meant and how, you know, I, I just take a real personal, um, you know, recollection of everything that happened uh, with the Central Park Five because I was actually there. And my grandmother worked for Spofford. And if anybody knows, Spofford is a detention center. So what I, what I found out while doing the interview, while interviewing one of the members of the now exonerated five, Raymond Santana, is that he actually remembered my grandmother. Like, it was crazy when he said, I was like, wait, you know my grandmother? And he was like, no, everybody know, you know. And it, 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 was, it was, but he's walking me through everything that happened. And I didn't know that he was going to, to describe it in, in such vivid descriptions when we were doing the interview, but he really broke it all down and I'm listening to it and you can picture everything that he's saying like, like a movie, you know what I mean? Like, he, cause he's describing everything. So that, that interview I, I was not prepared for, but it was really a, a powerful interview. It's interesting, the people you interview in the chapter on the Central Park Five, it's Raymond Santana, as you mentioned, Officer Carlton Berkeley, and you also spoke to a member of the legendary group, The Last Poets. Um, can you speak about the wisdom that that, 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 that that perspective brought to this conversation? So I spoke to Abiyadun Oyewole, who is a, the legendary member of, of The Last Poets, and he also was there. So I took him back to that time period. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that he used to do is he used to come up to Spofford and have these poetry workshops. So he knew Raymond Santana, and Raymond Santana knew him. So he's talking about the climate that was going on there and really describing it and what it what you know what the NYPD was doing, you know, kind of attacking all young black and brown men and how it, you know, everything that everything that you saw depicted in the movie, he just went deeper into it because he was actually there. And then um, you know, talking to Officer Carlton Berkeley, um, you know, I've seen him do a lot of workshops with young people of how to when you interact with an aggressive police officer. So I wanted to talk to him about it and go back to the case and talk about all the different things that the police did that were illegal, break everything down. Who can you call out the police or, you know, so a real technical standpoint, because I wanted it to be kind of like a booklet for one, for young people to know their rights. Because if you saw the movie, they should have never talked to the police in the first place, like ever, like don't ever talk to the police without your, your parent there or your lawyer there. That's like number one. And so he repeated that so many times, but it's just kind of like a, you know, like a learning tool for everybody to use when unfortunately they're stopped by the police. You know, it, actually, you know, it's interesting that throughout the book at different times, you do interview uh, police officers, retired police officers. What did speaking to them uh, teach you? Uh, how did it shape your perspective about policing and what we're, what we're doing right now? And to the officers you talk to, uh, do you think, because you, you speak about police brutality being an American tradition, mm -hmm. are these officers more on the side of trying to reform the system or do they think it needs to be dismantled and rethought of? Um, well, that each one has a different different opinion on that, but they they all recognize that there is a problem that needs to be fixed. And one, the reason how I connected with a lot of different police officers was really back when I was doing the panels with uh, We Matter athletes and activists. And sometimes we would have police officers come to the to the panel and they would either be a panelist or we would just have them, you know, come and listen. I, I took a note from if you remember when Carmelo Anthony and I interviewed him for We Matter, uh, when he had that big um, conference in LA right before they went to play the Olympics and he had you know it was much talked about and they had like police officers and members of the community they had a chance to listen to each other and hear each other and things of that nature so I kind of try to duplicate that 
um, at different times. And I connected with different police officers. And, you know, every time and now and then you hear, you're like, oh, okay, let me, let me, let me reach out to them and see, you know, what they're thinking, the work that they're doing and things of that nature. And, you know, we've actually even had um, some police officers on our show on the collision. And, you know, it, it's, it's when you hear from them, um, you know, it, it's, I don't want to say refreshing for me. I'll just talk about for me. Um, when I was doing We Matter, it was refreshing to hear them verbalize that they recognized that there was an issue and something needed to be done. And if you did speak out about police brutality, you wasn't just automatically anti-police. And it was refreshing for me to hear them say that. And, you know, because if you look at, listen to the media, it's like, you know, if you say something, you're automatically in this bucket and you're automatically anti and against and everything like that. And it's like, well, no, it's not against police. It's just against police brutality. Everybody should be against police brutality. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that, that's why I continue to use their voices, um, you know, in the books. Now, that is important because a lot of the defenders of police and the police associations and unions, I've noticed that in recent years, gaslighting has been a big tactic of theirs. Definitely. They're trying to make you feel like, oh, well, now you're telling me there isn't a problem. You know, my yeah. eyes tell me we have a racist policing problem and a violent policing problem. And now your response to that is not to say either, yeah, let's talk about how to make it better. It's not to say, you're damn right, this is the way we do it. It's more to say, what are you talking about? I don't yeah. know, I don't see what you see. And that, right. That, that's pretty yeah, nefarious. Right. I agree. Keep having the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, 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 I zeroed in on your chapter about white privilege and allyship. I mean, you spoke to Rex Chapman. You spoke to Sue Bird. I mean, these are people who are trying to get, get their hands dirty doing the work. What, what did you get out of that chapter? What did it speak to? And, and, and what in your own life did you feel like it connected to? Well, there was a lot, you know, I mean, there, there, there's, there's something about, and I spoke to Kyle Corver as well in that chapter. Yes. Um, and they spoke from their experiences about white privilege. And there's something that, that resonates a little bit more with mainstream America when they hear white people talk about white privilege. You know, there's a, there's a certain segment of the country where if they hear me or, you know, another black person talk about white privilege, you get the eye roll. You know, you just don't want to hear it. There's resistance. What do you mean? You know, but when they hear white people talk about it, it's just received a little bit differently. And they all um, said this on their own accord during the interview in different ways. Mm. And so it's just, it, it was interesting speaking to them because they recognize it and they recognize the need for them, them in particular to speak out on it. Hmm. And it was, and it's not something that they have to do. I mean, they could have gone about their life and their business being quiet. They didn't have to say anything, but then really looking introspectively, you know what I mean? And saying, okay, like Kyle Corver, he was like, you know, I've grown up around black people. I've had black teammates all my life. And even I, you know, he talked about when he saw Russell Westbrook, um, his teammate, um, got into an altercation with a Utah fan and he jumped on it immediately. His first thought was, well, what did Russell Westbrook do wrong? You know, and he was kind of like embarrassed that he thought that. Or when his teammate Tabo Cephalosha had his leg broken by the NYPD, you know, his first thought was, well, what was Tabo Cephalosha doing to get his, and then he saw the video and he felt bad that he even had that thought. Mm -hmm. So he's talking about that, how it's just ingrained in you, even when you don't even want it to be. You know, so it, I, I thought that 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 chapter was really powerful because it's going to, you know, make a lot of people kind of examine, do a lot of self-examination. Yeah, I could, reading that. I could totally see like uh, classrooms discussing that. Actually, mm -hmm. several of the chapters are classroom discussion worthy. I think this is going to be an incredible tool for teachers going forward. Although in some of these states, teachers might have a tough time with a book with a title like this. I know. <laughs> uh, which is unbelievable. Me. Not allowed to talk about history. Right. Um, Rex Chapman's an interesting person because I read in a different interview once that um, that his first aspiration on social media was to create, as he put it, world star hip hop for white people. Mm. Like just like <laughs> funny videos that right. are 
<laughs> well, that's how he started. So that's how, that's so how he started. started. He, he, and he talked about that. He started doing the blocker charge. Mm -hmm. And there are fun videos, and there were, you know, he was having a good time with it, and he was getting a lot of laughs and a lot of views, stuff like that. But then he talked about how he started looking around because, you know, he's in Kentucky, and, you know, it's, it's Kentucky. <laughs> so he's looking around, and he's like, wait a minute, well, why is this happening here? And, he, and during the interview, he talked about when the Kentucky players took a knee during the national anthem. And I think the sheriff of Kentucky was like burning their jerseys on TV and like saying they should be ran out of town and using all this like language, like from back in segregation, like they should be ran out of town. Like they're college students. What do you mean? So Rex Chapman saw that and he, and he started speaking out about it. And then honestly, he just hasn't stopped. Like he started talking about the insurrection and the Trump administration that he just hasn't, he hasn't stopped, but um, yeah, that wasn't, he, he said that wasn't always the plan for him. It just kind of happened. Hmm. No, it, it's been a remarkable thing to see in sports in recent years. Because you remember for years, we were saying, you know, wh where are the white athletes? Where are the white athletes, right. Where are they? And I right, thought right. teams are supposed to be like a family. Where are they? Yep. And you have seen this important layer of athletes speak up and try to model what allyship uh, looks like. So I guess... You know, from, from talk to them, does, does it, I mean, do, do you have faith in allyship as a method for fighting racism? Do you see a role for white people who don't want to live in a racist society to have something that they can do more than just say, argue with their uncle uh, <laughs> at the holidays? Oh, definitely. No question. You know, and I think that one of the, the things and the examples that they're all using um, in there is how they themselves can use their voice to be allies. And um, another person I interviewed was uh, Brianna Stewart. Um, and she talked a lot. She talked about how she was, she was driving and she was, she was riding in a car. This is when she was in college and she had like her, her, her like two black friends. It's like a, one of her ones was a her teammate and then a guy. And the police pulled them over and they asked the guy, she asked her, are you okay? And she looked and she's like, what do you mean am I okay? And like, are, are you okay here? Is everything all right? And she was like, yeah, are you going to ask them if they're okay or is this just for me? And she was like, the police officer thought that she was like kidnapped or in this. She was like, no, I'm not. But just the, her, her examining why that happened, you know, and like, why did that? And so they're doing all this examination of different things that, that were going on. And she started talking about how she's standing on the Olympic podium. They won the Olympics. And she's looking at the, you know, national anthem being played. And, you know, there's, there's great pride having that dichotomy of you feel the pride because, you know, you just won in the Olympics, but then you see all these other stuff going on in your country that you're not proud of. And she talked about having those dual feelings at mm -hmm. the same time. And she's like, I have to speak on it. And she spoke about it publicly and she, you know, got a lot of backlash and she talked about how, you know, People wanted her to just shut up and dribble. They wanted her to just be quiet, be thankful, and don't speak about anything that doesn't pertain to you. And mm -hmm. her point was that, but the fact that it's even happening to anybody allows me, doesn't allow me to stay quiet. And I had a lot of respect for that because, again, you know, they don't have to speak. They don't have to, you know, it, it, it's different. So the fact that they are willing to do that, um, I think that's really important. You have this chapter on that you call whitewashed Christianity. And I thought it was a very, very brave chapter, a reckoning. You speak to Bishop Talbert Swan, Chris Broussard, and the chef himself, Steph Curry. What, I have two questions, really. I mean, the first is what, just what you got out of speaking to those folks and what, how was that experience? But also, could you speak a little bit about how you uh, rectify, you know, your own Christianity with the way mm -hmm that you know the religion has been used historically to uphold the very traditions that you talk about here in terms of particularly white supremacy? Well, I think that it's up to, and we have this conversation a lot when you speak out against, um, you know, the things that are happening in Israel and the different things that are going on and against the Palestinians and the, the terror and everything. And, I, and, it's, and it's, you feel compelled to be one of the main people that speak out about it. Um, I feel the same way, or like where you have a, a you know men that need to be able to speak out 
against, um, you know, misogyny. And, but you're a man. You need to be able to speak out and say, no, this isn't right. Um, that's what I feel with, with this. And, and even a step further, you know, I, I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is the, the heart of the Bible Belt. Um, you know, every, every depiction that you can have that has been televangelist, Jimmy Swaggart, all of that, I grew up seeing all of that, right? And the white evangelicals didn't look at me as equal. They didn't look at me as their brethren. Like, so I, it was very strained, um, you know, so when, so when the, the rise of the evangelicals with the Trump supporters started to come, I was like, oh yeah, I know them people. I grew up with them. You know what I mean? Like, I, I know what they're about. And, you know, Mr. Talbot Swan had this uh, quote, I don't want to mess it up, but he, he said that um, one of the things about white evangelicals they're too caught up in their whiteness and they haven't gotten to being Christian yet. And I, I might be messing up, but it's something to that effect. And um, I 100% saw that all my entire life growing up. So, so the need to call that out, if you're going to attempt to represent Christ and you're doing it that way, I feel an extra duty to call it out. So it's interesting. So I ended, you, you mentioned Chef. So um, I interviewed Steph Curry for the chapter. And he talked about why he couldn't support Donald Trump. He was like, so aside from the laundry list of things that he disagreed with them, he was like, as a Christian, he his values didn't line up with Donald Trump. Now, not to just, and, and this is, I'm paraphrasing what Steph Curry said in the book. He said, now, I'm not saying that I'm here, you know, trying to judge somebody or you're not worthy. He's like, but he's not even trying. Like, he's not, he's not even an attempt. Like, you don't have to be Christ, but you have to be on the road to at least trying to do right. He's like, how could I, how could I support him? And when I was interviewing him and he said it, he like, they're like, how, how can I support somebody like that? But the thing is, you see white evangelicals throwing their support at him. And then that just shows the hypocrisy because it's like, well, y'all supposed to be the party of the values and all this stuff. But then you have Trump come along the opposite, but you still support him. So I just feel a, that's a long-winded way of saying I, I feel a duty to point out that hypocrisy and to call that out every single time. No, it, it raises this question about can white evangelicals be one to anti-racist causes or would they actually have to leave that wing of their church? To do so and become a different kind of Christian. I mean, I'd like to think that they could say that their values also can be humanistic, but to see them choose Donald Trump, who would be the antithesis of family values, like all the things that they have, you know, I think in some cases correctly hounded politicians for over the years uh, for personal failings. Here's Donald Trump, who's like the the poster child for personal yes. failings. And I agree. <laughs> But th their allegiance to his his whitehood um, mm. was was greater than their allegiance to any basic tenets of faith or morality. Yeah, and so that that makes yes. me concerned about the possibility of of actually winning them unless they say, you know what, I'm going to become a a Methodist. I don't know. I just threw that out there, but just <laughs> say, like I'm not going to do the political thing anymore. Right, right. No, I hear you, but that's 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 why I you know feel a special need. To, to call that out every single time. Hmm. Just shout out to everybody uh, tuning in. You're talking to Tom Thomas about his amazing new book, Police Brutality and White Supremacy, The Fight Against American Traditions. It's a powerhouse of a book. It can be used in a thousand different contexts. If people have any questions, please click on the Q&A box. We're gonna get to questions soon, but I'm gonna take advantage of all the time I have here. You know, it's such an amazingly varied group of people who you interview, Atan. And I, I was surprised to see among the athletes, among the activists, among the family members, I was surprised to see Jake Tapper's name among them from of, mm -hmm. of CNN. Can you speak a little bit first of how you got in touch with Jake Tapper and and about the context of that interview? What What you think the reader gets out of that interview? So with Jake Tapper, I was watching, you know, we just passed the anniversary of uh, January 6th insurrection. So, you know, uh, it, it was right after January 6th, uh, 2021. 
And so I'm watching all the events unfold and I'm watching the media coverage of it. And then I, I see Jay Tapper calling out other members of the media for their role and in, in, in kind of stirring the pot to allow this to happen. Now that caught my attention because you, you know how I am with the media and I'm, you know, the, the, I have a lot of issues with a lot of things that happen in the media, but you usually don't hear um, somebody on CN, CNN calling out all members of the media. Like you, you'll hear the right calling out the left, you know, Fox News calling out MSNBC and vice versa, you'll hear that. But Jake Tapper said, anyone who falls into this category, no matter what network they're on, you know what I mean? You are, you know, part of this problem of what happened and you are partly responsible. He was saying, if you allow someone to come on your show and to spread lies and go unchallenged, then you're helping them spread the lies. So he was really, you know, um, he was really stern about this. So that's what caught my attention initially. Then I saw him referring to them as terrorists. And he said, no, we're not going to do this thing that is that, it, that keeps on floating around and calling them protesters and calling them, you know, not people who are unhappy with the election or trying to, you know, um, do their right to assemble or their freedom of speech. And all. No, they're terrorists. There are domestic terrorists and everyone should use that word. That's what caught my attention there. And I was like, okay, huh. Well, let me, let me, let me reach out to him and see, cause I want to go into a little bit more depth of how, why he, why he went on the ledge that way to do that and why and the backlash that he received, if any. Um, and it, it was an interesting interview. You know, it was, yeah. it, it really was, you know, when talking about the January 6th and talking about how important the media's role is. And, and I think people sometimes discount that. You know, there's a reason why Malcolm X said the media is the most powerful entity in the world because they have the ability to shape public opinion. And that's absolutely true. So him calling out the media the way that he did, I wanted to get go go a little bit deeper in with him. And I reached out to him and he hit me right back. There was really, it was no big process. I didn't go through all these different steps. I just, you know, messaged him like uh, on social media and he hit me right back and that was it. Yeah, it's interesting. The the part of the book that deals with January 6th, you talk, it's such a great uh, three three person combo. You've got Jake Tapper, Jamel Hill and the legendary Mahmoud Abdul Raouf. Right. How did how did they shape your thoughts about January sixth, if at all, or what wisdom did they bring to the table for you? So, so there was so much. So Jamel Hill, you know, we started off. It was interesting. We started off talking about her with ESPN, and I was like, you know, you got into a little bit of hot water for calling, you know, Donald Trump a white supremacist. Um, but now, looking back at this this far removed kind of proved himself uh, to be exactly what you called him. And I asked her if she got her own apology from ESPN or anything like that. Um, but then we started talking about January 6th and it, it was interesting because the conversation went to how it was a model of white privilege. And she talked about how black people, and I'm gonna paraphrase what she said, but she's like, black people couldn't have even had the thought bubble of doing something like that. She's like, if we was meeting in DC and whispering that this would happen, the police would be right there. Like it wouldn't, like the, 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 we know that that's just something that we can't do. We talked about the talk that black parents have to have with black children. And, you know, I've had to have with my children, just that, you know, you go to school, there are certain things that you might see your white counterparts do that you can't do and you're not going to get away with doing and the punishment is going to be completely different. So don't even think about trying it. And this was another example. Um, and, you know, she talked about how the Trump supporters insurrectionists came in there with just the confidence that there was nothing wrong with what they were doing. They didn't even have masks on. And she kept, she kept saying that. They didn't even have any masks on. They weren't even covering their face. And these were regular people like, like teachers and doctors and educators and, and you know, politicians and like people that had some something behind their name. Like they were, you know what I mean? But they were just Small there. business owners. 
Right. Like they were just there, <laughs> like they were supposed to in, the, in what they were doing, the, how they pushed past the police and, you know, had the audacity to run in there and, you know, literally defecate on the floor and smear on the walls and tear stuff up. She was like, if black people even thought about doing it, she was like, you imagine what that would have looked like if that was us doing it? And she kept saying that over and over again. And it was, you know, she definitely had a point. Indeed, for sure. And I think that's one of the ways that we need to start thinking and processing this uh, because we've got a whole political party who wants to now turn it into some sort of day of great remembrance, like some lost cause civil war crap. And I, it's like the way you do that is you wage a war against truth. Right. Um, now, you have a chapter called Defunding the Police. I love this book, like I said, because it really <laughs> does feel like you wrote it yesterday right. and got it printed in 24 hours or something, you know, like through some magic because every it's like ripped from the headlines. Right. You know, you, you speak to uh, Corey McCoy, Mark Lamont Hill, Officer Joe Estead. Mm -hmm. And as, I, as you're no doubt aware, you know, you've got a lot of mainstream Democrats saying, ah, we can't say defund the police anymore. We can't speak mm -hmm. about funding priorities with regards to the police. That can't mm -hmm. even be part of the conversation because it, you know, pushes away suburban voters, which is another way of saying white voters in the code. Right. And, um, right. If black people don't live in the suburbs. Ah, right, yeah. <laughs> right. And, and, but but it, it raises this point, though, that, that you're – you're proudly projecting it and putting it forward. And I was just wondering like the thought process that went into that. So I wanted to first break down and it's so, you know, exhausting always having this conversation of what defunding the police actually means. Um, but I just wanted to um, showcase a actual case where defunding the police applied. So if you don't know that I, I, you mentioned that I interviewed Corey McCoy. So Corey McCoy was the brother of Willie McCoy. Uh, Willie McCoy was killed by the police. He mm -hmm. was um, in, in Vallejo, California. He, the story is that he was asleep in a Taco Bell. That's what he was doing. He was asleep. The person inside the Taco Bell called the police for a wellness check. That there's somebody that's in the parking lot and they're asleep. Can you just make sure that they're okay? That was the call. But the police came guns a blazing and they, you know, shot him like all the police just unloaded like it was like a like a massive um army you know felucia type of attack they just unloaded he had no gun no he was literally asleep in his car so now the 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 point is that the police are not the ones who should be called for wellness checks for non-violent um health and wellness mental health anything that has to do with that they shouldn't be the ones that are called because they're not trained to deal with that. And mm -hmm. so that's what I talk about throughout the whole chapter. If the only way that, that you're, you're trained is to deal with everything like with a hammer, right? Everything's going to look like a nail to you, no matter mm -hmm. what it is. And that's the way the police are trained. So if they, and, and I've done countless programs, um, panels, everything like that. And they police will all say, we have to wear too many hats. We're not trained to deal with it. Okay, fine. If you're not trained to do this, then why should you get the funding as if you were trained to do this, to handle this department? The people who should get the funding for this in particular, carved out funding, should be somebody who's trained to deal with this. Mm -hmm. So that when they come to a wellness check, when they come, and there's so many different cases of, of wellness checks gone terrible. Later on in the, in the book, I interview um, the family of a Tatiana Jefferson who is the same kind of a deal. She was in her house. The neighbor called the police because her back door was open and they would just want to make sure that everything is okay with my neighbor um, because her back door is open, but this is my neighbor. He said it like three times, but the police came and literally shot her through the window. They didn't even go into the house. And, then, and again, it's like the police don't need to be called in that situation for a wellness check. And so that's why I, I presented it that way. Instead of just having the argument about defunding the police, I'm going to show you specific cases where this applies. Absolutely. And, and Officer Joe Estes, what, what did he bring to the table? So he brought a lot. So he was somebody who 
he he does, and we just had him on our on our show on the collision. Um, right. And his background is he now has dedicated his entire life to fighting against police brutality from a systemic standpoint, not from a bad apple standpoint. Um, and he always makes that point clear. Um, he said the rules and the laws and the training and the way that it's set up is a systemic problem. And, you know, he, he's talking about the, 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 the structure and he talks about how police officers are trained like military. And he goes into detail about, it's like the, 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 the programming and, you know, how it is at camp and what you're supposed to, it's like you're supposed to become almost like a machine where you don't have feelings, where you don't look at people as people. They're like targets. And he's talking about the, 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 the type of training is, is, is why you have the results of what you have. It was a really, really um, eye-opening interview because this is somebody who was on the inside. He was actually the vice president of the police union. He just couldn't take it anymore. And he said, okay, I'm gonna try to you know, do this from the outside. And he wrote an amazing book called Police Brutality Matters. He speaks in different you know, places all over the country, really amazing. Um, but he's somebody also that recognizes that there's a problem and he's trying to do something about it, but he has, um, you know, the skin in the game because he was a police officer and a high ranking police officer. So I think it was really important to show those voices in this, that it has nothing to do with being anti-police because there are police also that are talking about the same systemic problems that need to be changed and, you know, coming up with different solutions to change it. And he has a whole, he has a whole outline of ways that it can be changed. Um, mm -hmm. It was very, very insightful. Yeah. No. And I think that's important. Like what you said is that this is a book that also tries to be solution oriented mm -hmm. and not merely laying out the problems as they exist. Um, do you think that we're going to get this book into the hands of some of the folks who disagree? Do you think it can move the needle and push people? Cause I, I see this book, as being something that can actually impose conversations that might be uncomfortable, but are still conversations that people are can be willing to have. But it's interesting because you know I I thought that with We Matter, and that's when I started talking and and doing events with with different police, and I was really pleasantly surprised. I didn't get the resistance from a lot of the police. Like I, it, you know. If, if, if some of them didn't like the terminology from what they've heard that the terminology means. But once you start breaking everything down, they don't disagree with anything that is said. And it, it's, you know, it's going on like a, a Fox News where people are dedicated to misrepresenting your position and dedicated to causing destruction. I think that might be a little bit of a waste of time. I don't know. I'm kind of, you know, on the fence, do I do I want to do that? Do I need to go into Fox News and, and argue with Tucker Carlson and, and mm -hmm. Sean Hannity about? I don't know how productive that'll be. Um, but but for the people who you know, one of the things that I did with with We Matter is I was going into a lot of colleges and universities before COVID. Um, but I do hope to to start doing that again. We just gotta you know round the corner here with COVID eventually. But you know that was really productive talking to young minds and having conversations and people, I, I mean, I went in there and, and with the, the entire group was the um, future future Republicans or young Republicans or something like that. And they all came there. We had a fantastic debate. And it, it, but it was a debate that was productive where they were like, okay, I didn't think of it like that. And we were listening to each other. And I was, you know, repeating to them, okay, I see how you got to that, but now look at it from this perspective. And then, so a lot of times they say, oh yeah, well, yeah, if I was in that position, I would have that same exact, you know, but but then that's when you're trying to create empathy, where just because something doesn't directly, um, and going back to what we talked about with Sue Bird and, and, and um, you know, Kyle Corver, be, just because something doesn't directly affect you, you can still say, but it's wrong that it affects anybody. Yeah. And so those those kind of conversations are wonderful to have. But the other ones where you're just debating on Fox News, those those kind of, I don't know. I don't know about those. Yeah, I mean, we, we need to have a revival of real debate in this country that isn't just that yipping heads going after each other. That's agree. absolutely critical. Now, I, I, I was so moved by the way the book ended. I mean, you end the book with a poem from your son, Malcolm, 
Uh, can you speak of, I mean, it's, it's a great poem. Can you speak about why that was important to you? So, so Malcolm has started this journey, you know, with me pretty young, you know, I, you know from my first, from, from the fatherhood book that I wrote, you know, I talked about when I accidentally let him, you know, I was watching Trayvon Martin coverage and he walked in and actually saw some of it. And so I had to have a talk with him and he was like six years old and it was way earlier than I wanted to have the talk with him. But now, you know, we're, we're here and he's 16. And, you know, I've, I've been taking him to different panels and speaking at different events, different colleges, you know, since he was young. And, you know, taking my daughters as well. You know, the reason why I have a whole, you know, chapter dedicated to, you know, police brutality, you know, against women. And I interviewed, you know, Keisha Clemens, who was a victim of police brutality at a, at a Waffle House. She was beaten up by the police. I um, interviewed Ganesh um, Alcindor, who was White House correspondent. She's talking about how it affects women and it doesn't get uh, the, the amount of attention that it get. Is I, I, I take my kids there to the different places and we talk about different things and having the talk and letting them hear different experiences and different opinions and things of that nature. So Malcolm, you know, with, with he started writing poems and he would open up for me sometimes or he would close an event or something like that. And, um, you know, when he was really young, he would just start off, you know, I started off when he was young. He was like six, seven, coming to events. And maybe sometimes he would just say a prayer or maybe sometimes he would just welcome everybody. But now he's, he's you know, writing his own stuff. And so he read the manuscript and uh, he wanted to write a poem about it. And he actually incorporated a lot of the different things that I was saying throughout the book. Um, I got to say, I was, I was impressed. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is, this is pretty good, man. We're definitely gonna put this in. So I was proud if, of him. It, no, he he he's a talent for sure. I mean, th this is incredible, talented work. I mean, people, when you get the book, you'll see for yourself. It's not like a one-page poem or anything like that. It's like an epic right. poem. Right. It's, it's it's powerful, man. He's yeah. it's like Homer, not Homer Simpson. Yeah. Homer, Homer. <laughs> Homer, like, Homer. Like the Odyssey, Homer. It, like it's it's amazing. Odyssey. I hear you. But we we, we are. At the point, let me ask you a couple of questions that have come up in the Q&A box okay. um, and see what you have to say about some of these as we begin to round the last turn here. Uh, but first, before I do, let me just say it again. The book is Police Brutality and White Supremacy, The Fight Against American Traditions. Jay, who I think tuned in kind of late. This is a Tom Thomas on the cover, not Huey Newton. Uh, <laughs> if that was confusing for you, just take a closer look. Um, Awesome cover, dude. Stop me in my tracks. Um, <laughs> Ricardo had the question, um, Atan, what was the most difficult or challenging part of writing this book and why? So it's always the, the interviews with the family members of uh, Police Brutality. Those are always the, most, the hardest. I mean, I'm doing the one with um, Tatiana Jefferson's sisters. And, you know, sometimes they break down in the middle of the interview because they're they're, you know, they're, they're re-traumatized by going through the different things. And it's always amazing because they always like, oh, I'm so, they say, oh, I'm sorry. I'm like, no, you don't have to apologize to me. Like, I'm, are you okay? Like, I, it, it, it's, they're always, those are the most difficult ones to do, um, all of them. But they're, they're so important and they always thank me so much and, and because it's therapeutic for so many of them. Um, but yeah, those by far the most difficult ones. I was I, I had no idea what you were how, what you were gonna say to that, but I was gonna say if this was me, whew, talking to family members, yeah. so difficult, yeah, so difficult. I used to do work with uh, family members of people on death row, and it was similarly, oh, wow. yeah, harrowing. You know, people fighting for their lives. Um, so, some more questions for you. Um, a couple, a couple from Sterling Hamilton. Uh, I might, I'm gonna, ref, I'm gonna read it as he said it, and then I'm gonna rephrase it in a bit of a different way. Um, Sterling asks, "Is it hard for Americans to accept the rise in fascism as it comes from mostly white and Christian citizens?" I'll, I'll rephrase that a little bit to say, "Is it hard for Americans to accept the rise in just all the different ways of re we see reactionary racism in our society right now?" Like, do you think it's harder for, say, your typical white person, 
who maybe doesn't see themselves as that political, do you think it's harder for them to see the threat for what it is because it's become so dressed in Christianity and the flag and all the rest of it? Um, you know, I think a lot of things were hard for mainstream America to really accept. You know, I think one of the things, and we kept asking ourselves this a lot, um, you know, after George Floyd was, um, that was like a point of awakening where so many white people were like, oh my gosh, there really is a problem. And we were like, well, it's been a problem for a long time. Why, why just now you think there's a problem? You know, and, and yes, this one is on video, but there have been plenty of other ones that were on video. So why did you, did you think we were exaggerating? Did you think it was, you know, oh, here are these black people go again, talking about police brutality. Let's wait till the facts come out. There could be something else, you know, let's look at the person's past, all those different things. But with George Floyd, it was different. You know, everybody was like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. Something needs to be done. So I, I don't, I don't know why. I mean, we, 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 We've asked that question so many different times of why, but, you know, I'm not sure. I don't know if you see so much that you kind of get drowned out of it. I don't, you know, I, I have no idea. That's actually a very good question. It, it is astounding sometimes how you have these changes in the polls about white attitudes about racism as if it all has to be relearned yeah. every time that there's a tragedy that provokes a broader sense of outrage. It's, Incredibly frustrating. It <laughs> is definitely, and it's this is this is where this is where we're at. Um, uh, Sterling had this other question as well. I don't know if I I'm not sure how I would answer this, but so we can. But I just I want to just respect the question to ask it. Um, uh -huh. Do you see an improvement of race relations in less common? I assume he means less popular professional sports such as hockey and soccer. It depends on where you are. You know, overseas, there's a huge racial problem with soccer. I mean, I don't think it's really stopped. If you're looking at the some of the, you know, they're still throwing bananas at players. They're still making the ape sounds. They're still doing a lot of ugly things that happen internationally with soccer. Um, I can't speak for much of, of hockey. Um, I know with the, with the NFL, you see it pop up. You see there was a time where, you know, Roger Goodell was going kind of back and forth, trying to figure out how he could, I don't know what he was trying to do. Oh, what is, well, how did you frame what Roger Goodell was trying to do? He want to he wrap his arm around Kaepernick? Then he doesn't want to. Then he kind of say, okay, I was wrong. I don't know what Roger Goodell. But, but, but I, I think you're going to see things pop up in sports and, and the reflective, you're going to see things pop up in life. It's just when, um, you know, I, I don't know. That's a tough question. I, you, like you said, it wasn't, you know, I'm, I'm not really sure how to answer that, but it, you, it's, it's, it's definitely not going. I'll say yeah, that. <laughs> I, I will. I will throw out for everybody that you know I'm not very knowledgeable about the scene in hockey, but there there's a book that just came out by. Uh, oh my goodness, I need to get the title right, and I need to get the authors right. Otherwise, I'm not doing it. it it's it's proper justice. So as I do that, um, I'll ask you this, Atan, as well. Mm -hmm. uh, for you, I know so you're somebody who music is very important to you, to your life, to your family. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to us a little bit about what was the soundtrack for you as you were putting this book together? Oh, Chuck D, Public Enemy. Yeah. <laughs> That's why when I interviewed Chuck D, I was like, it is crazy because, you know, I grew up on Chuck D. I grew up on Public Enemy. I talked about how when I was a little cat back in 1989, I was bumping Public Enemy. And so to interview him and have him talk about how he tried to educate through his music, um, I thought it was fantastic. Like I was just, he's telling stories and I'm sitting there like, oh, I see how you put that together. And like you answer the question with a story of why you made this song and why, what the song actually meant, you know, with the, and, and why you used a certain musical arrangement to be able to, you know, push the words through it, it was, I was, I was blown away. So yes, you know. Uh, Chuck D is as, yeah. as good a person as there is. I mean, that's Definitely. amazing that, that, that he's a part of this. It's just, it, it's terrific. Uh, the book that I recommend very, very strongly for folks is called Game Misconduct, Hockey's Toxic Culture and How to Fix It by Evan Moore and Josh Vina Shah. I wanted to get the title perfectly right because People put a lot of work into these books, so didn't want to just throw it off the cuff. Uh, Kathy Beige has this question for you. Okay. Um, 
So what do you think of, you know, the, the, the popular uh, graffiti term ACAB, which stands for all cops are bastards, and you see that written on walls and things like that. And does this kind of thinking, can it play into making progress, or do you think it holds us back? I don't think all of anybody is anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, there's, yeah. you know, good cops, bad cops, good black people, bad black people, good white people, bad black white people. I mean, I'll, you can't put everybody in one bucket. Um, I think one of the, one of the things that I that I did as far as interviewing different policemen, you know, just as far as the book, you can see that they're not, a, they don't, you know, a monolith. They don't all think the same exact way. Um, so I would kind of stay away from, you know, using one term to just describe all of anybody. Wow. That's that's a I mean, I mean, that that sentiment you said that you just said uh, really strikes to the heart of what's so, I think, important and terrific about this book is that it exposes the reader to a lot of different perspectives. And even if you think you know what you think about these different issues, police brutality and white supremacy, I can promise you that you'll read this book and have your thinking affected. I know mine was. So I want to thank you so much for putting the work into doing this, Atan. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. It was definitely an honor. Oh, that's terrific. Any last thoughts before we go to the good people at Powell's? Oh, I appreciate always, always shout out to Powell's. We just did, you know, your book with uh, the Kaepernick effect. Absolutely. It was, it was amazing. So it was great to come back and talk about mine. So it, shout out to Powell's. Definitely. Appreciate it. Definitely. Right. So over to you, Powell's. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Satan. It's great to uh, hear you guys talk about this book. Police brutality, that's what it looks like here. I'm gonna put a link to it in our chat. And there it is right there. So click on that and you can buy it from us. Uh, there's Dave's newest book too. This was a reversal of roles from an event that we just did a few months ago where Dave was talking about his book and, and Aton was the uh, conversation partner. So uh, that is uh, on our YouTube page. And I'll put a link to our YouTube page right there. Um, this event will probably be going up there sometime tomorrow. If you have other friends or people you want to share it with, feel free to do that. Um, lots of great stuff on there, all of our uh, Zoom events that we've been doing in the past um, uh, almost two years now. <laughs> um, Dave, Aton, again, thanks so much uh, for being with us. And everyone at home, thanks a lot for tuning in and have a great night. Appreciate it, appreciate it.